basically what we are going to do in this last lecture is to see how uh, we could apply some tools from complex system science to analyze uh, concrete problems actually in, uh, in 5G or you know, in general how we, could, uh, how we can model modern networks using um, understanding that comes from complex systems. So in general, I mean, networks, the way we define them are pretty much uh, graphs. You can see them as graphs um, where different nodes, transmitters and receivers, uh, you know, various uh, entities in the communication network interact. It doesn't have to be only wireless. You could actually see, you know, the overall communication network as a graph if you want. So there are things like handshaking, uh, device association, device registration. Uh, you could see them as basically interactions between different nodes. For example, if, if a device has to associate to a base station, you could think uh, to have a link between the device and the base station, right, for that specific functionality. And if you collect, collect all such links, you have basically a network. Now, these links do not necessarily have to be radio links, though as wireless engineers, it's probably what we are mostly interested with, but um, there are other ways you could define, uh, you know, uh, graphs uh, concerning communication networks. For example, you might have a link uh, every time um, a user is actually um, associated to a certain um, uh, you know, is basically chosen for transmission by a certain uh, scheduler even before you have transmission, right? It might be a cap like a um, good way to actually model how you collect information, say for IoT, or how information propagates, okay, uh, from node to, from one node to another. In general, the um, we have all the, um, uh, basically all the uh, tools that come from graph theory in this case, and we can, we can use them to our advantage. Now, the question, okay, so that's kind of the underlying uh, working assumption. You need some model for the network, which is uh, sort of abstract and, you know, possibly graph-like to do some work with complex systems normally, at least in my, in my experience. Now, the next question is, can we model future networks or even modern networks as with complex system science? Um, now, we saw this morning a definition of complex system, which might come handy. So, we saw things like self-organization, okay, basically being autonomous in the decisions. Um, generally speaking, you have dynamical systems that change with respect to the environment and with other systems coexisting with them. Uh, you have the concept of feedback loop, right, and nonlinear uh, input-output relations, so you might have a positive or a negative feedback. So dy dynamical systems are kind of what we are after. Generally speaking, the decision-making uh, for a complex system is distributed. So you don't have a centralized central unit telling to the rest of the system what to do, but they independ independently kind of the um, subparts of the systems, they decide what to do. So now if you just, you know, put a different tag uh, to these characteristics I said, you might actually uh, hear a lot of bells ringing, okay, because there are many things we are trying to do in 5G and we were already honestly trying to do in 4G that actually comply nicely with this definition, gracefully, okay, we don't have to force anything. So when I'm saying that, if I say that 5G networks have to be autonomous, capable, cognitive, self-organizing, or I'm saying that we need to use resources and, to, you know, to um, basically reconfigure the network dynamically, or I'm saying that there are a lot of indi like distributed entities that have to take decisions. Think of sensors, small cells, uh, even massively distributed MIMO if you want to go down that way. So I think it's, it's, it's a natural match. So what you could think of is that 
networks are actually collections of black boxes taking locally informed decisions. So a black box could be even a network or, 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 you know, of its own. And what, what you care about really is how the different black boxes interact with each other. Okay? So you don't necessarily need to understand the full level of the details of each network is black box as long as it does what it's supposed to do. Be it an access point or a collection of access points or even a network as a whole. Okay? So one example we will consider today is frequency assignment and we'll see how this kind of uh, reasoning can be, can be useful. We didn't necessarily do that so far, but uh, at the moment we are more trying to understand how to model and uh, you know um, how the networks as, as, as they are or they will be behave, but we are not attempting at the moment to design them. Okay, that's something we still have to do. So you could think of the future world, at least the future you know, wireless world, as, as a, um, an ensemble of self-organizing entities where, for example, the predominant mode of access is dynamic. I'm just talking about the spectrum because it's the example I'm going to give you, but possibly many other things are dynamic nowadays. Now we will try and see if this collection of possibly cognitive autonomous self-organizing systems can be treated as a complex system. And whether by using complex system science we might get something in terms of understanding that we, don't, we didn't have before. So as a first specific application, we'll tackle an example of uh, self-organizing frequency allocation. And each autonomous network or base station uh, is modeled as a cell, not necessarily the cell we are used to from cellular networks. It's a cell actually as an abstract concept, like as a part of a lattice, okay, like a, a grid kind of. And each of these uh, components of the grid, we call it um, a cell. And it will follow a set of se very simple rules for self-organization. So I have to take a step back and tell you a bit more what I mean by a cell. So there is this concept which has been popular in computer science especially for the past uh, 30 years or so. It's called cellular automata. Essentially it's a spatial lattice of uh, cells which have some states. It doesn't have to be a physical space, though in this case we will map it to a physical space because we will have different base stations taking actions, but it doesn't have to be. Um, the state at time t plus 1 depends on the state at time t of the, of the specific cell plus the state of the neighboring cells at time t. So it's essentially a mapping between the state of the cell and the neighboring cells at time t, what the state of the cell at time t plus 1. And every cell in the lattice will basically just look at the former state of the cell itself and the neighbors, nothing else. It's a very local way to go about things. Normally the rules, are not necessarily, but normally the rules are uniform. uniform. So you have the same kind of uh, rule for, for all the cells. It's normally useful when you have, your, for example, in situations where there is some structure going on. So that's why it kind of resonates with the idea of complexity. Okay, so if it's a completely random an intelligible situation, then this cellular automata approach wouldn't do too much. For example, you need to define the neighborhood. You need to define, you have to be, you know, you have to take, you have to design rules hoping that they will do something useful. So there has to be some structure in your system. And it has been subject of great mathematical study. So definitely we are not uh, here about reinventing the wheel. We are just applying something very well understood. And there are many more complicated models than the ones I'm going to talk you about in terms of cellular automata. So the scenario is basically like a regular lattice um, where you have actually the sub-index, this um, basically, uh, you know, pe uh, pedix is like um, uh, the time index. So A0 means basically something that happens at time T0 a1 times t1 with t1 greater than t0 and so on. And actually you can show that the way uh, you know this system works it kind of evolves like with concentric 
circles. So you start from A0 and then it, it will evolve. Unless you have to change something, then you might step back. So these colors simply tell you, let's say if you're focusing on the green cells at time T3, you have to check what the neighbors are doing before you pick your channel. So the, the, the rule here is that you have to pick a channel which will give you and the rest of the network the least amount of troubles. So it must be a channel which, which is not used by other neighbors or at least is not used so much. Um, and then you have different colors. Um, basically these colors simply mean the um, you will check whether these neighbors at time T2 or time T3 have changed their state because that's where you have to be careful. Okay, so you have to, you will have basically to pick uh, a channel being cognizant of the changes in the environment. So it's like you start with a certain channel and all is good and then at some point, some, if nothing happens, you, have, you don't have to change your channel, but if something happens, then you have to check, right? And at most, I mean, because of the geometry in this case of the problem, you will have to check what five neighbors are doing. Either you are at the corner of the current square, say this square. So either you are at the corner or you are at, uh, in another point in the, in the sides, right? If you are at the corner, you have three neighbors. If you are in another point, you have five. So it means that actually though it's distributed, you can at least theoretically guarantee the absence of interference if you have six channels available. Because in the worst case scenario, all your f you will be in this situation, you will have four neighbor five neighbors, they will all have ch uh, kind of, you know, be active in a sense, so they all change something, uh, and they pick five channels, maybe one each, that's the worst case scenario, so you will pick, uh, you will pick a sixth one, and that's it. So if then if you do, if you develop your scheme properly, you will not have interference, okay? We are going to check uh, to what extent this is true though. Any question? No? Okay, so now it could still be, I mean now this R is actually the side of the square. So R equal 100, it means you have a square with 100 cells per side. So it means you would have 10 to the 4 cells. Yes? So it's a lot of cells and you don't have so many channels available. We just said we are going to, to try with 6 at most. So it could happen if you have if you are completely synchronized. So they all decide as the tradition uh, the traditional cellular automata assumes synchronization. So every time, so at every time, all the cells will update simultaneously their state according to the rules. So it could happen because you are not going to observe the others normally. You just you can just see what happened in the past, but you are not going to know what the others at the same time are doing. Right? You, you don't know until you check again. So it could be that you clash. It could be that you pick actually in the unfortunate case that all the neighbors pick the same channel. And that's very bad in terms of interference. So what we did here is a small modification, which again doesn't touch the self-organization, distribution, distributed nature of the problem. It just diminishes the probability of clashing, of collisions. Because what we are doing, we are just slotting the uh, time interval into capital M sub intervals and you have a random clock which awakes the cell so once you are awakened you choose okay and it's very unlikely that all the cells will awake at the same time if this number m is high for example if m is thousand it means you have essentially it's a very small probability that you are going to clash with others because it would happen only if out of thousand possibilities, all the neighbors pick the same one to transmit, right? Of course, it could still have some clashes because, I mean, you have a lot of cells, so you have 10,000, so it could happen, but not so often. So here we are not even reaching 1%, if you look at it, actually one per mile, right? But if you just increase it a bit more, this uh, number M, then you're basically getting no interference, okay? And you're doing that in a very simple way. You don't have a very global planning of frequencies, very complicated optimization. It's really very intuitive even, right? You just check what the neighbors did and you do something else. 
nothing else okay and it's even the, the it's a single hop if you want communication you don't have to convey information anywhere hmm? so that's kind of a bit that's a bit the philosophy of complex systems you take decisions locally and then somehow globally uh, good properties emerge okay that's an example okay that's one thing so self-organization and now we can use it for possibly resource allocation um, one thing we also did is to study the um, complexity and the entropy quantities so for example the entropy you can compute it like this so let's say you have a target cell x hmm? so then you have to start to define also for entropy and complexity essentially what you have to do is to average overall the possible conditional entropies okay and conditional entropy means you have to check uh, some neighborhood okay and then you're going to see what is the probability of X having a certain value in this case a certain channel given that the neighbors have that configuration and you have to count all those configurations. for example if you take M to be 2 you will have actually this neighborhood here and you have for example let's say this guy uses the red channel this guy uses the blue channel so to compute actually uh, the entropy, you would have to average overall the cells that have as neighbors blue and red. You count those occurrences and then you divide by the number of such situations, regardless of the color. So that's one of the probabilities you're going to plug in into your, your entropy. If you remember how Shannon's entropy is computed, it's essentially minus p log p yeah so that's what we are doing here so that's the way you compute entropy and you will have to actually take theoretically m to be infinity or at least to cover all the all the um, uh, lattice okay that's entropy and we know about it how about complexity though so for complexity we actually took um, um, a measure which is called excess entropy and essentially we are going to do the same thing but we are going to subtract the um, overall entropy of the system so what we are doing here is actually distinguishing between what is just uh, apparent randomness from what is actual randomness in the system so in a sense we are trying to become more knowledgeable less ignorant if you want about the system so if m is one likely uh, you know you will have um, essentially what would happen so you would have basically the same thing right but yes so that complexity is zero right because you're also you're still very ignorant about the thing correct in this case, basically, you, you're right. It would be that basically um, all the randomness, you, you can't really see whether this is real randomness and you take that all you see is actual randomness, but it's just that you don't know enough. The minute you, the moment you increase M, actually you, you will have these values to be more and more uh, um, large, okay? So, so basically what you do, you, you are going to sum the difference between H of M and H. This is some noise, or is it me? Hello? Hello? Is some noise? Okay, okay. I see so now, again. Uh, is it only me here? No, there is some noise, right? Okay. Anyway. Uh, it's fine. Yeah, so fine. we'll try to carry on. Um, maybe speakers. Some bips? Yes. Now then. Seems like a tape or something. Yeah. Like a belt. Okay. Ah, anyway, so fine. Yeah. 
again. The time I say fine, it reappears again. Okay, anyway, so yeah, okay, so I suppose we just carry on, okay. Okay, so basically you compute this limit, and then what you do, you will actually sum um, these, these values, okay, uh, where you subtract h of m minus a. So for h, you definitely have to go to infinity. So if you take m to be infinity, this excess entropy uh, would basically be uh, all the sum of the former terms and then zero in the end. Zero is just when you are at infinity, correct? So actually, I don't think when m is one, this is zero. I think this is zero when m goes to infinity. That's the only sum, that's the only term in the sum that is zero, okay? Because basically, what, um, what is happening is that, uh, let me think, so h of m is getting closer and closer to h. Yes. So when basically uh, m tends to infinity, you're getting closer and closer to the actual randomness in the system. But before, this is not real randomness. This is just something you don't fully understand because you didn't take correlations that are long enough. So you are kind of studying the correlations in the system in a sense, okay? And you're seeing that's, that's where the structure lies. So, so you can actually distinguish between two things. The entropy, which is the ultimate randomness in the system, and anything else which is due to lack of knowledge, okay? So anything else is actual complexity, okay? Um, now, I mean, there is some theory behind, but you know, in essence, what, what uh, again, is the story we, s we saw before, that you have randomness, which is actually the case where complexity and uh, entropy, complexity is minimum, and entropy is maximum, so this kind of situation. In fact, it makes sense, so we have complexity to be zero, and the entropy is basically log two of six, because we have six channels, so it's the maximum value. Um, we know from information theory that if you have a, a set of e equally probable options, right, that's the maximum entropy. That's when we have the m highest uncertainty, which according to Shannon is the highest information, basically, or entropy. Um, and then if you have the regular structure, both are zero, as you would expect. And then in between, you have a higher value of complexity and an intermediate value of entropy. So it's a kind of an indication that the system behaves as some sort of complex system. Now, one, just a comment, you know, uh, basically, um, we talk about entropy. And actually, you heard about entropy in another field before, I'm pretty sure. Anybody that remembers where? Thermodynamics. thermodynamics, right? Formation theory is one, but there is another one which is uh, thermodynamics, right? And there is that there actually is a relation uh, because basically Boltzmann equation has to do with the entropy, right, of a system, and essentially is something that is proportional with the Boltzmann constant, essentially to the logarithm of the number of microstates that give rise to a certain macrostate, right? Um, which is very similar to what actually we are doing with information theory. Uh, and it goes beyond the analogy uh, because actually there is some um, physicality of information, if you want. For, you are used to see information as something abstract, but eventually you always have to record it on a, on a medium be it a paper, a piece of rock, uh, DVD, right? You, you can't have information in a vacuum. You have to, so there is, it's physical also. Another thing, um, there, there is a famous paradox, it's called the Maxwell Demon. If you didn't hear about it, check it out, because it's very fascinating. And eventually, uh, what, so what the demon does, so the, it's a thought experiment that was invented by Maxwell. So we go back 150 years or so. Uh, basically, imagine something like there are two, there is like um, a box and there are molecules. Some are uh, hot, so they move fast. Some are cold, so they move slowly. And the experiment uh, is like that. So you have basically a partition 
so a partition that can go up and down and there is a demon like uh, you know some you know imaginary entity that decides when to open the partition so whenever it sees um, a, a hot particle coming it would open a partition and let it pass okay from say right to left and whenever it sees a cold particle it would do the other way around from left to right but never the other way around so eventually what happens according to this thought experiment is that you would have you would end up with the half of the partition very hot with fast molecules and half of the partition very cold now that intuitively doesn't make any sense because you're like violating the second law of thermodynamics you're essentially uh, creating information out of nothing if you want you could, if you could have this in practice, you could have, for example, uh, refrigerators that do not need electricity or stuff like that, right? You would not have to do some work to get some, something done. Now, the trick is, this is not necessarily the whole story, because there is, um, uh, there is something we are missing here. So, the, the demon, this entity, still has to store information about the molecules it must operate with some memory okay because it has to know what was cold and what was hot basically but any memory the demon will have is going to be finite anyway you can't have an infinite memory right we don't want to have any fake thing we want to play with physics here so what happens is that at some point the demon will have to start to cancel things to to make room for new information and this operation of cancelling is going to cost you energy. It's very small, but it exists nonetheless. So that's where, if you do all the math, then you don't violate the second law, okay? But, I mean, what I'm saying here is just that, you know, there is a very tight interaction between information and, and uh, physics, okay? So it's not by surprise that we use the term entropy in information theory because, in fact, the genesis is from thermodynamics, okay? It's just that in Boltzmann theory, I think you just assume, because it's a statistical mechanics thing, so you're not going to have any special particle. They are all alike. So they are, uh, essentially the microstates are all equally likely. But in, in Shannon information theory, we are not bound to do that. That's just the maximum Shannon entropy case, but we, we can change the probabilities as we want. So it's a more general theory if you want, Shannon theory. Okay, hope it makes sense. There are actually nice resources online. There's a very nice uh, video from BBC. It's called BBC Horizon. You can find it on YouTube, as far as I know. And it's about energy and information. I think the first half of the documentary is about one hour. It's about energy. And then the second half is about information. And it's very, very interesting, actually. Okay. No, we studied another thing. It's like some trajectory of complexity and entropy and see how they evolve. How they evolve in the sense of, um, let's say we have our set of cells and we are changing the, the percentage of cells that are inactive. So we start from zero, where this, there is no cell that is inactive. They are all active. Up to one, all, all are inactive. The network is switched down, basically. Switch off, yeah? Um, so, in the regular case, as we know, you start from entropy and complexity to be zero. But then, if you start to increase the probability of, of um, cells being inactive, you start actually to increase both entropy and complexity. Okay? And then, up to the point where everything is switched off, so you go back to another dull case. Okay? What I'm saying is like, what we are trying to say is that the dynamics of the system play a role. So complexity and entropy are not carved in stone. They depend on the actual dynamics of the system. Same for the self-organizing case. Random case is a bit duller because it starts to be, it's a very uninteresting case in a sense. So you know that the entropy is maximum. So what you're going to do, you're not going to add any complexity to that, but you might actually decrease the randomness if you start to switch off nodes up to the point again everything is switched off. Uh, the self-organizing case, you will not increase the complexity if you start to switch off cells, but you might increase entropy 
up to the point again where everything is switched off. So the final state is always zero complexity and zero entropy if everything is switched off. No randomness and no structure. Okay. It would be interesting to have equation to actually have because these are still like uh, discrete things. You know, uh, it would be nice to have something like of a dynamical system theory for these things. We don't have it yet. We we are considering if we can do something. It would be nice, in essence, to try to see how these things change with time and with the environment dynamics. We can't do that at the moment. This I showed you this morning. So essentially, the self-organizing systems are robust against changes. So if you compare with the centralized planning strategy, they are going to react faster. Uh, and it's going to be less likely that we'll, you will not find a solution to, to the problem where say a cell changes the channel without coordinating with the others and then the system has to cope with that. The self-organizing systems are going to be better at, at finding a new solution based on the local rules. The centralized system is slow. It has to have the full picture before taking action and sometimes because of the way you see the essentially the, the, the regular system follows a pattern it follows the same pattern all the time. So sometimes it might not be possible to apply any pattern. The self-organizing system is much more flexible. It doesn't follow any specific script. It just tries, okay, according to local rules. So it's much more flexible. Okay, any questions so far? That's about the first application. So you can model. Um, for example, a problem of channel allocation um, as, as a complex system, you can benefit from it in terms of robustness. And we have, I mean, I, I just have one hour for this, so we have more work. If you go to our website uh, that I showed you this morning or you asked me, we have more work going on, okay? And we have other papers being written, so uh, this is just, just one example. We did apply, for example, this frame, uh, similar framework, not exactly the same to uh, wireless sensor networks also. And also to vehicular uh, ad hoc networks with, um, with IIT KGP actually, yes. Sir, how, what about the interference in self-organized network and uh, centralized? What about the comparison of interference? Um, that's a fair point. So the um, interference actually for the self-organizing one, I, I'm showing it here. So this is the average number of interference cells out of 10,000 in this case. So it's, it's small. And if you increase this uh, possibility of relaxing the synchronization, it's basically 10 to 0. Uh, the centralized, I think normally it works, um, it's fine. But if you, for example, if you start to change the picture dynamically, that's what we are showing here. In some cases, you do not have a solution. So R equal one means, so we, we put a constraint on the cells that can change to avoid kind of a cascade effect, right? That all the network starts to go, become unstable and changes happen everywhere. We don't want that. So if, if a cell changes a node, uh, changes a channel without coordinating, so in an uh, unplanned way, so R equal one means that you can only change the allocation in the outer tier, number one, are equal to, you also add the bigger tier. So a square will have, uh, you will have squares of nine squares and squares of 27. Uh, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, yes, right, it's three, three, and 25, let's say nine and 25, yeah. So essentially the, um, the centralized one is more constrained. Now, it still does a decent job of finding a solution for R, for R equal to. They both work, but what you see is that the centralized planning case needs more changes before it stabilizes. So it will need, for example, there is a probability of 60% in this case that um, actually you have, you need up to four changes and 40% that you need more than five more or equal, uh, you know, greater or equal than, than five. But for the self-organized one, you actually, the same probability 
is actually, first of all, there is even a chance that you don't need to change anything. So the system is kind of already robust in the first place. You might need to change something, but it will happen so that you have only 8% probability that you need to change more than four times before you get the right combination, while the centralized one is 40%. It's five times more, okay? So that this one indication that, and it's not so surprising because the centralized is very good if everything goes according to plan, right? It's a very static way of allocating. It's like what they do nowadays when they do frequency reuse, right? It could be an issue also delay, right? So self-organization, it might not be optimal all the time, but tendentially it might do a good job and it's quick, okay? It's so it R is the area, M is like just the number of slots. You, is not, so basically you have a certain slot and you divide, subdivide it into M sub-slots. So what we are doing with this, you are just randomizing if you want the probability, you are, you are minimizing the probability of collision. Because a problem with self-organized is that everybody acts independently. So it could be that me and you are neighbors and we pick at the same time the same channel if you are synchronized. So in this case, synchronization is not good. So we are kind of desynchronizing the system. And it's very unlikely that we will, we will be active at the same time because we just decide randomly when to activate. So we would have to activate at the same time and pick the same channel. And if we have 100,000 possibilities, it's very unlikely. Of course, over a large network, something might go wrong, but very few times, right? Any other question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so basically what happens here, you, yes. So, okay, first of all, this is uh, a lattice, which is regular. Uh, so that's an assumption we make because cellular automata, there is also work with less regular cellular automata, but we, we picked like the traditional one. So then basically these are base stations essentially, okay? So then at time zero, you start somewhere, okay? So the evolution of the system is so that it becomes kind of, uh, it's like when you throw a pebble in the water, you start to have circles, right, forming, it's the same thing. So we start from some point and then, so at time zero, only the cell A0 is active and it picks whatever channel it wants. Then at time one, it will be the turn of the new, uh, of the next year. And these guys become active because they sense something has happened in, in, uh, in, in the neighborhood. Essentially, A0 did something. So they, they become active and they will have to choose uh, a channel. And essentially what they do, they have to check two things. What A0 did, but also what their neighbors at time one did, right? And you can actually show that you're never going to have more than five neighbors anyway because it's, it's a square ge geometry, right? It can be more than that. So if you have six channels, worst case scenario, all five channels are busy, you just pick another one and that's it, okay? Um, now the color simply means uh, in this case who is active at time T2 and time T3 and, a, and the green one is the cell of concern. It's just that, okay? And you're basically going to just... Uh, pick the channel that is least used or maybe unused by your uh, neighbors, okay? Another thing we do to minimize the probability of um, instability in the system, once you pick a channel, you cannot do anything for two time slots because if you just allow everybody to act all the time, it becomes prone to instability in the system, okay? So there are some things we have to assume so that it doesn't go you know, it doesn't start to oscillate too much in the allocations, okay? We have a paper in ICC a few years ago and also a journal on this, if you're interested. Any other question? It won't be the case though in practice. In practice, M is going to be more modest. 
uh, well, m, m, the m could be infinity because you could consider um, a neighborhood, uh, you know, if you have, let's say, an infinite network, possibly, you, you know, I, I mean, this is ideal, but uh, in general, though, you wouldn't, I, what we found, at least in these systems, you don't have m that are too large, six, maybe, four, six, something like that, and then you don't add more. So then you are you are ending you you are hitting the wall of randomness, and nothing else will happen. So essentially, what we notice is that after a small neighborhood, these contributions become zero. Because you are not going to learn more. By so it depends on the system. There are some systems that are nastier, where you probably have to take longer correlation. Some systems are more dull, and and you have to take um, you know shorter correlation. It depends on um, on the system. So I'm thinking, for example, if you have a completely random system, let's say, l let's forget about the 2D. Let's say you have a string of bits, 1D. Maybe it's easier. So if it's a string of bits and they're equally likely and they're just basically the outcome of the toss of a coin, do you think correlation would help you in that case? No, because even if I study more and more longer and longer uh, it doesn't tell me anything, correct? On the other hand, you have the extreme, the opposite extreme, which is you fix from the beginning uh, a, an alter, an al uh, basically um, an alternance of zero and ones. So you have zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, forever. It's kind of a crystal-like. So in that case, what is l the correlation length you really need? You just need to know whether you are in zero or in one, possibly, nothing else. Because once you know that, you know everything else, literally everything else. Now, of course, the interesting cases are the ones in between, right? Where you have rules that are not so trivial, like the random one or the kind of, you know, uh, crystal, crystal-like one. And, and that's, that's normally where the systems are. But I essentially, what, what we are trying to do with complex is to capture the, the correlations in the system. If you do not take, if, if correlations is there, if correlation is not, is not there, we are done. It's random, okay? But let's say correlation is there. You will have to study enough of the system to, to, to realize that there is a correlation, right? So you will have to, to, have a, to study a, a portion large enough before you capture that. Up until the point, all is captured and there is nothing else, else to be learned. The case of uh, zero one is like you just need one and then you can keep on correlating more, but it won't add any information, okay? So essentially you have to learn about the correlations in the system and that's what we call complexity. Until we do that, it might seem random, but in fact, it's just that we don't know enough, okay? So basically, if you have, uh, so you see, I, before you start to even observe it, the, the regular case, you could assume maybe it's random, right? Until you look into it, and very quickly you, re you realize it's not. But b you have to do that still, right? If you, if you do not observe, then actually there is a principle, it's called maximum entropy principle in, in complex systems, uh, and it actually tells you that the best starting assumption all the time in science is maximum entropy because that's the most unbiased assumption you can make, uh, that the different options that could describe the system are equally likely, until you know more and then you relax this, right? But the starting point is like when you have an invest a crime investigation. All the people at the scene are potential suspects. That's the right way to investigate the crime. If you have a prejudice or you're biased, you're doing probably something wrong, you see? so. You start from an assumption which is essentially maximum entropy, and based on that you move on. But the starting point has to be that. Absolute ignorance if you want. And then you know you are going to, to know more and more until what is left is the real um, you know, the real randomness, not what you thought was randomness and it wasn't. Okay? Now, there is another work we did, which is a bit different. It's more on the statistical mechanics side, so if you want, so what we call disorganized complexity. Um, but before doing that, I'm going to tell a bit about um, the concept of network. 
So a network, as we know, is a collection of entities that are interconnected by links. Uh, people that are friends, uh, computers that interconnect, uh, it can be in biology, proteins that interact, all of these are actually, could be an example of a network. Network science is actually a field that is emerging in, uh, you know, recently, and it is, it is basically a field that studies um, complex networks such as information networks, uh, biological networks, social networks. And it draws on a host of theories, including graph theory, statistical mechanics, data mining, and information visualization. I mean, we saw even before that we get a lot of insights and understanding by visualizing things as well. It's not just the math. The equation might not tell us everything. To see things is also important. Um, so, and, and, and others, okay. So, but basically the, the definition of the U.S. National Reserve Council is like, that, that network science is the study of representation of networks uh, that could be physical, biological, social, that lead to predictive model of this phenomenon. So you want to have to build some models that help you understand networks that are normally not trivial to understand. Okay, if you have a very large uh, social network, it might not be apparent who are the influencers. So who are the users that bear some influence on the others? Is there any weak tie? Weak tie, I mean, is there any link connecting subparts of the network that if removed, completely isolates the two communities? Okay, for example, you have to, you could think of it as a social science thing. If you have two factions that are fighting, maybe within a community, it would be a good idea to realize who is the key person maybe the ambassador of the the guy trying to be the the peacemaker right and if there is only one it might be a good idea to to have a few more because if this guy is taken down right there is, it starts to be complicated so there are actually very important you know applications of of this kind of uh, of science but essentially it's graph theory applied to real networks that's what network science is other things is like is there a hub is there a node that is special so that it has many, many connections and maybe the rest of the nodes are like more like leaves. They are connected to uh, a node, but they do not necessarily have many connections themselves. So the degree of a network, so many links are there per, per node. Other things like, um, is there a node that is important in the sense that all the information flows through that node? Uh, th there is a measure called in between and centrality that does that in graph theory. So there are many, you know, uh, interesting tools that we could use actually for um, uh, to study, you know, these uh, these kind of problems. So more examples. So you have you can go into biology, you can go into economics, um, scientific publications. You know, uh, pretty much networks are everywhere. So we, we used, I mean, uh, a model that comes from statistical mechanics and we do have something, some application of graph theory also. So we form some model of the network uh, to study the interference of wireless systems. So we, we try to use the POTS model, which is a model using statistical mechanics. And essentially there are a few things uh, that uh, we, we had to translate from physics into communication engineering. For example, what they call energy for us was interference. So you can actually compute, you see this sum is summing over the neighbors. So you have two neighboring cells, I and J, and you, you sum the delta of Kronecker. The delta of Kronecker is an operator that gives one if the two arguments are um, the same and is zero otherwise. So sigma i and sigma j are essentially the channel, in this case, chosen by cells i and j. If it's the same, delta will be 1. Minus j actually is, uh, so j is m negative. So minus j is positive. So you are going to increment the interference. If sigma i and sigma j are different, the delta of Kronecker will be 0. And that's what it should be because different channels do not interfere, okay? So that's what they do with spins 
I'm not a physicist, but they have this, they use this model to, when for example, you have multiple spin possibilities. Um, and, uh, and they use it, for example, to find out whether there is some alignment of the magnetic field. And we use what is called anti-ferromagnetic here because J is negative. If J is positive, you have the ferromagnetic model. This, these are things they use in, in statistical mechanics. The degeneracy is the number of options that are equivalent. What do I mean? So now H of sigma is the interference associated with a certain allocation pattern sigma. Sigma is the configuration of channels you, al you, associate, you al allocate to your cells, whatever number of cells you have. It's sigma is basically a vector, right? Where it has the channel given to each base station. So it will have a certain interference associated with it, which is every time we have a clash between neighbors, it, it sums and it increases the aggregate interference. Yes? It's a measure of aggregate interference. So the degeneracy is about equivalent options. So what do we do? We sum over the possible configurations that give us a certain interference E. So all the configurations of channels that give the same aggregate interference E are essentially indistinguishable. It doesn't matter to us. System-wise, they are the same, right? Okay, so if you get interference of 10, say, because you have 10 clashes, whether you get it with channel allocation A, whatever that is, or channel allocation B, doesn't matter. You just want to know how many of these you have. Why? Because, for example, you are happy with E, and you want to know how many options you have. It could help you to design protocols if you know how likely it is one, uh, you know, that interference or another. Maybe we are going to see that. Changing a bit the interference you are happy with might give you an enormous amount of opportunities more to achieve that. We're going to see this, okay? Um, yeah, one problem here is that you have to, you're dealing, that's why we use statistical mechanics, because the system is, has an immense search space. You could have something like five channels, and in a normal network, for example, the network we studied, we are talking in the order of 500 nodes, and it's already not a very big network. It's probably like a decent network, uh, maybe for a small country. So you would have five to the 500 options because every node could pick five channels and that multiplies. So five to the 500 is, is a very large number, too, too big to simulate or to check exhaustively. You can't do brute force here. We don't have really math because the system is, the, you know, we, the best we can do is to adopt statistical mechanics I in this case. And um, so that you have to have a smart way to sample the space. That's why statistical mechanics is, is good. They have like uh, some tricks. For example, they might tell you how to actually um, change the allocation of channels so that um, you basically sample all the energy space, okay? So you might, they might tell you what the important, if you want, um, energy values are, okay? So you, you, you might actually be told what energies are more important than others and you check the allocations for those somehow because you can't just check everything, it's too big. Okay, um, so you, you, there are some strategies that tell you how you can subsample such a large space and still they have expressions that tell you that the error is bound and it can be very small. So you are not going to sample all of it, possibly a very tiny fraction, but you are sampling it in a smart way. Okay, I'm not going deeper. If you're interested, I, there is a PhD thesis Actually, this, this work was done by a doctorate, uh, doctoral student in mathematics. So I co-supervised the guy and I gave insights about the communication part, but there was a main supervisor from the math department. So it's very formal, you know, I'm trying to simplify, but it might require that to go through the thesis if you want to understand. The, there are a lot of formal results actually about this. So eventually the graph we are interested in is an interference graph. So you are going to um, essentially um, compute some uh, 
SIR, which is basically uh, signal to interference ratio. Okay, so you just um, and you have SNR. So basically, we try to use a, a real realistic deployment to test the thing. So you what we, what, what did we do? So once you get the graph, you can apply all of these things. But before you have to build the graph. So to build the graph, we use the system level simulator, which is uh, you know uh, 5G compliant and 4G say compliant. And then we use the positions of the base stations are realistic because these are given to us by an Irish operator. Okay, and then it's just path loss. We didn't do really too much complicated channel modeling, but it's it's somewhat realistic. So you do measure SIR you do measure SNR. And basically, you are, consider, uh, you are considering two cells to interfere each other when a, a, a portion of the users larger than a threshold is interfered. So if my users are going to have an SIR lower than some threshold because of that cell, and quite a few of my users are uh, experiencing low SNR because of that cell, we are interfering. And even though it's not strictly true, we assume it's symmetric. I'm also going to interfere that cell. Okay. Um, another thing we are assuming that SNR has to be higher than some value. If I am interfered and my SNR is bad, doesn't matter. I would not be able to communicate anyway. So we have to be fair, right? In the thing. Okay. Uh, another thing to build a graph we have actually to build one-to-one -one relations. We have, to we have to link nodes. Interference is normally not like that. It's aggregate, right? It's not that uh, interference is a binary thing. You do have everybody interfering with everybody, but that complicates the things too much. And there are works actually that tell we are not introducing too big an error. In essence, you are still considering probably the strongest interferer, so but you are simplifying things compared to reality. Now, a bit about the results, and then I stop. So, okay, so this theta is essentially the amount of users that are interfered beyond which you declare interference is there. So, theta 1% means if 1% of my users are interfered, then I say that cell is interfering with me. 3% I'm more tolerant, 5% I'm more tolerant still. So, 5% means Maybe I have some FI capabilities. Maybe I have lower quality of service. It means interference is not absolute. It's relative to the capabilities and the uh, expectations you have, correct? So of course, if you have a higher theta, it means it's more and more difficult to form a link. The link is about interference. So if I am more tolerant toward interference, I should see a network which is less connected. I should see a graph which is less connected, right? It's more difficult to form a link now. So of course, the k, which is the degree, is the probability. Let's say k is the number of neighbors, and n of k is the number of such nodes that have those number of neighbors. So k is moving to the left if you increase theta, because you are going to have a less connected graph. You're going to have less links, OK? Now, the final result, and then we finish. So we tried, actually, what happens if you have three channels available or five. So, and these, uh, the axis, so E over N is essentially the interference. And this uh, strange uh, thing there is the degeneracy. So it's the number of possibilities you have providing you with that interference. The number of allocation possibilities network-wise, so you know, the vector, let's say, of channels you can use, the number of vectors of channels you can use to achieve a certain interference. Hmm? For example, silly example, you have two cells that are adjacent. How many such possibilities you have? Two, if you have two channels, because you could have one, two to one. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Of course, this is more channels, more cells, but that's what we are doing. So, if you have three or five channels, what happens? First of all, you will start to have more possibilities to achieve the same interference. Look at the number. This is normalized, but this is higher. Of course, because you have more channels. You have more possibilities that lead you to the same interference, right? Another thing, if you have a theta that increases, it means 
you are actually uh, decreasing the value of interference, but that's by default because you are you are more tolerant, so you are going to see less interference because of what you what you decide, right? You say I'm I'm happy even with a bit more of interference before I really say you know interference is a problem, right? So of course it goes to the to the left. Uh, another thing, this is the value you see the extreme left of these curves is the value of um, minimum interference is the minimum possible interference on the left and again the value is going up with more channels available uh, the, the degeneracy so I have more opportunities to have minimum interference if I have more channels available one thing Another thing is um, with theta, again, this value is going up. So both the number of channels and how tolerant you are with interference will help you. If I have more channels, I will have more opportunities to be experiencing little interference as well as if I am more lenient toward interference, of course. Yes? Now, the, in the last interesting bit, which is probably the most interesting result, if this is okay, this is like just counting essentially how many opportunities you have to, for, to have a certain interference, but the interesting bit is when we compute the CDF. So this is the probability of the, the, the interference being less or equal than some value. So what do you notice if you observe these curves? You know how a CDF should look like more or less, so what, what is strange here? This is a typical CDF you see in your works. What do you think? Should be a bit smoother, right? This is like really a step function, yeah? It's like more like this, this is it's a wall, right? So what does it mean? It means that values of low, you see the values of uh, essentially that are unlikely, which are these guys, and the values that are very likely, these guys, let's go to the extreme. Something slightly larger than zero, something slightly lower than one. They couldn't be more different in terms of probability, but guess what? It's a vertical line, so the interference is kind of there. What is the message? So if you are just a bit more tolerant toward interference, you have an immense amount of availability of channels that will give you that. If you are too picky, it's kind of, you know, you're, it's, it's against your interest because you're becoming picky for the sake of nothing. It's just become very, very difficult to give you that extra epsilon in interference uh, protection while maybe you just have a tiny better phi cancels that tiny bit of interference and you're good because you will have a tremendous amount of channels available. Now, we, we didn't continue this work. The, the ex natural extension would be to start and see if you can design a protocol. This is just, uh, again, something analytical. Uh, more of a scientific study. The engineering interesting part would be to design a protocol showing that this is true. Okay, and this for very general networks. Okay, so sometimes just changing the tool, the story might give you a lot of insight. So I never saw these kind of things before we started to use graph theory and statistical mechanics, honestly. So we are not cheating, we are not doing anything weird, we are just modeling our network in a different way than usual, and you start to discover things you didn't see before. So sometimes the tool matters uh, as well. Okay, so that's the end of the course. I don't know if there is any last comment or question before Professor Da starts the valedictory session, right? How do you generate the time if you have more data than the Yes. It does because you, it gives more options. Well, in this case, you have more options of, of channel allocations that give the same result.